Thank you, Michio-san. It's such a, a great pleasure to be here at Aslo Biwako, and I have the honor of introducing our first plenary speaker for this Congress. And that speaker this evening is Dr. Nancy Grimm, who is a professor of ecology at Arizona State University in the United States, and currently serving as a program director at the United States National Science Foundation. Dr. Grimm is well known internationally for her research on how climate and human activities influence ecosystems, ecosystem processes, ecosystem services, and for her work as the founding director of the Phoenix, Arizona Long-Term Ecological Research Program, which is an, an interdisciplinary study of the Phoenix urban ecosystem. She has been president of the Ecological Society of America and also of the North American Benthological Society, and she is currently lead author of the National Climate Assessment. And the title of her plenary talk is Global Environmental Change and the Water Challenges of Cities. Dr. Grimm. Konnichiwa. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you uh, to the organizing committee for the honor of speaking to you at this historic Oslo meeting in this beautiful place. I'm an ecosystem scientist uh, that specializes in stream ecosystems, um, part of the subject of uh, limnology and lim waters, and biogeochemistry and cities. Uh, today, I want to speak to you about the water challenges of cities in the face of global environmental change. Global environmental change has moved our world into a new geologic era, the Anthropocene. As human activity has ramped up, changes in the Earth system have gone hand in hand. And these pictures that you see up here are just a sampling of the many kinds of changes that uh, are exhibiting the same temporal pattern. So these changes on the left in human activities uh, are leading to changes in uh, Earth system processes. And you'll notice that many of these changes involve water and aquatic ecosystems, not only because of their sensitivity and the connectivity of water to essentially most of the world, but also because they are so often and dramatically modified by humans. So ecosystems and life on Earth are subjected to multiple stressors, and in this era of global change, the Anthropocene, we need new theory to replace that that was developed during a period of apparent environmental stasis, as pointed out by this recent article. So in this period of stasis, a lot of ecological theory developed, and here we are in this, in this much more dramatic current rate of change. One such emergent theory concerns resilience and the concepts of uh, tipping points and regime shifts or ecosystem state change. With aquatic ecologists like uh, Steve Carpenter, who has described regime shifts for lakes playing an important role in the development of this theory. Resilience comprises uh, resistance, um, which can be thought of when you think about a stability landscape as this kind of uh, ball and cup metaphor here. Resistance is, is the depth of the cup. It, it, it really, uh, one component of, of resilience. The range of variability, how much that uh, ball can move around in uh, that landscape before it crosses a threshold. Precariousness, or the, the closeness of the system to a threshold, to a tipping point. So that's a fairly precarious uh, system there. And um, cross-scale influence is also called panarchy. And resilience implies the maintenance of um, a system's identity, structure, function, and feedbacks. So these, these tipping points or thresholds may be crossed, leading to uh, regime shifts or even transformation. And it could be difficult to reverse those changes. 
So a question for our consideration here is what features make cities as socio-ecological systems or more specifically urban water systems more or less resilient in the face of different stressors like global environmental change, climate change, and so forth. So today I'm going to focus on two studies. The first is um, at the global scale, a global view of the challenges that cities face in providing water for their inhabitants, and then a local examination of the efficacy of different stormwater systems in dealing with high flows that uh, are occurring now and might become more prevalent with climate change. Um, linking these two studies is the, uh, is the observation um, that there is a regional difference in um, both the drivers, the kinds of challenges that cities face, and the potential solutions. And the messages that I want you to keep in mind um, during this talk are, first of all, the interactions of different stressors, like um, climate change with urbanization, and um, the uh, uh, utility of the ecosystem services concept in considering um, these issues. So this diagram here shows us uh, some of these interactions that occur across three scales, uh, local, regional, and global. And the interactions among these different kinds of, five different kinds of environmental change that I've listed here, um, as a result of human production and consumption activities, uh, land use and land cover change could be seen as one of the fundamental or most important uh, drivers of the remaining environmental changes at all scales. At the local scale, land use and land cover change uh, produces urban uh, socio-ecosystems, aka cities. And we hypothesize that the city is more of a driver of global environmental phenomenon than it is a responder to events occurring at the global scale, but that it's a big responder to these kinds of local changes uh, that occur um, so the urban system is mostly responding to local changes. Well, what about cities? Um, we can see from this uh, lights at night photograph that I'm sure you've all seen before that the world is a pretty urban place. It's already half urbanized, and that proportion, the proportion of the human population that lives in cities is expected to rise to 70% by 2050, the middle of this century, which will add 3 billion urban inhabitants above what uh, the number of urban inhabitants is today. Because over 80% of the population of the developed world already lives in cities, most of that increase in population is going to be happening in the developing world, and most of that with the rise of very, very new, very, very large cities, um, over 10 million in population. This rapid urbanization is in itself a major facet of global environmental change. Urban socio-ecosystems are dependent upon the services that are produced by um, ecosystems that are often external to them for such things as providing food and clean water, cleaning the air, and even spiritual and aesthetic values. These are called ecosystem services and they're directly linked to human well-being, um, as described by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And this is their diagram there. So we can think about some aspects of human well-being that are very closely linked. For example, personal safety linked to uh, stormwater buffering, for example. Some ecosystem services may be produced inside cities, but many others are external, um, which underscores the importance of the natural uh, world of, uh, of uh, natural ecosystems for urban populations. Well, one such service is the provisioning of fresh water. And to explore the implications of rapid urban growth for this ecosystem service, we asked how will 3 billion new uh, inhabitants actually uh, get their water? So to answer this question, we constructed a global geography of water challenges for all cities over 50,000 uh, people, inhabitants, uh, in the world. 
And this was done as part of a working group in the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in Santa Barbara, California. And so I want to acknowledge here the, the leader of that group, Rob McDonald from the Nature Conservancy and other co-authors of, uh, of that project. We evaluated the water provisioning challenges along three axes, um, and you can see those axes here. And the first is the absolute amount of uh, water that's available within a region for human appropriation uh, for urban use. The second axis is um, uh, if, if you have the water available, you still have to get it to the population, so it's a delivery challenge. Um, providing available water to the urban population usually requires infrastructure such as pipes or dams or canals or even wells. And then finally, water quality uh, is, uh, if, if you can get the water to the people, it has to be of high enough quality and uh, suitable for, for urban household uses. So it's reasonable to think that this population of cities, uh, the world's cities over 50,000, um, would fall within this three-dimensional space somewhere um, and uh, uh, have this uh, particular geography. So to do this, um, uh, we chose three uh, proxies for each of these, uh, of these water, delivery, water challenges. Um, and I'll explain these in a little more detail later, but just to introduce those, for water availability, we chose the aridity index. For, um, for water delivery, we chose the size, the rate of population growth relative to the available economic resources to build new infrastructure to deliver that water, so that's a little complicated, Wa new population per per capita GDP. And then finally, for water quality, uh, we chose the population living upstream from a point. And so this is for the first um, of those uh, three for the uh, water quantity proxy, the aridity index, which is defined as precipitation over potential evapotranspiration. And what we found was that uh, 27, was it 21 percent, 21.7 percent of the urban population lives in semi-arid or drier climates and therefore experiences this uh, water qu quantity problem. Um, but I want to point out that this proxy has some problems associated with it. For example, many arid land cities develop along rivers that are providing water from higher elevation or from wetter regions. Um, and a, a Nile is a really, the Nile is a really good example of that. Um, secondly, what will happen under climate change? Well, some areas um, will uh, see increases in precipitation, and other areas will experience increased drought um, at frequency and severity. Um, but also, not, the t not only the total amount of water, but its distribution in time, its seasonality of precipitation, as well as the timing of snowmelt, um, that is really important in some mountainous regions uh, are going to be important determinants of uh, overall water availability. The second uh, axis, this, uh, the water delivery proxy, um, here again we use this, um, this uh, number of new residents per economic resources available and a value of 10 is considered to be uh, a situation where uh, the population is simply growing too rapidly to, um, to help keep up with demand for new infrastructure. And what we find is that over half of the urban population experiences this challenge. Um, the time frame here is the year 2000 to 2005, and as we see increased um, uh, urban growth, these problems uh, will, will compound. Um, in, in this case, climate change is really less of an issue than the rate of population growth and land use change. And then finally, in terms of water quali quanti quality, what we use is an index, a uh, very well-known relationship between the number of people living in a watershed and the nitrogen, nitrate export. Um, nitrate at high concentration is a pollutant, as you know, and um, at a a population density of uh, above 5.5 people per hectare uh, nitrate concentration would be about 10 milligrams per liter, um, which is a polluting level. And 36.9% of the urban population lives downstream from that number of people in the watershed. 
Now, obviously, the problem with this proxy is um, it assumes that some uh, more important pollution, pollution sources, for example, agriculture, um, and, and that people have the same effect on pollution no matter uh, where they live. However, it is a good and well-established relationship, and so this may actually be um, reasonable. So finally, um, climate change. What will climate change do? Well, increased flows may worsen water quality problems, especially um, in, uh, involving uh, the transport of sediment. And then finally, the same re uh, working group led by Rob McDonald uh, conducted a modeling study um, looking at future climate change as well as population growth. And they suggest that urban water scarcity will increase due to rapid urbanization compounded by climate change. So for example, the size of the urban population that will experience water scarcity will rise by over sixfold from 150 million today to almost 1 billion by 2050. Um, generally, though, the impact of urbanization and uh, this movement and population growth in cities is greater than that of climate change. So to conclude for this part, um, what can we say about the resilience and vulnerability of urban water provisioning at the global scale? First, um, rapid urbanization plus climate change put water challenges at the forefront for global sustainability, and I don't think that's really a surprise to anyone in this audience. Um, when rapid urbanization transforms landscapes, the resistance to change is low, but latitude may be high. I mean, there may be lots of opportunities for um, developing um, urban systems that, um, that can uh, persist in this kind of situation. Um, the rapidity of urbanization may force some cities across um, uh, tipping points or thresholds, and adaptation to these changes will rely upon um, an economic base that can, that can provide um, uh, relief from water scarcity problems. So the maps that I've shown you at the global scale already indicate that the distribution of water challenges in, is not uniform across the Earth's surface. And let's look closer at some projections for the continental United States to illustrate what might lie behind some of those, uh, this variation. Um, this is a map uh, that was taken from a recent publication by Roy et al. that illustrates um, the expected changes in water scarcity, here they're calling this the Water Supply Sustainability Index, uh, with and without climate change, so with climate change on the right and without climate change on the left, for the continental United States. Um, and this shows that the risk to provisioning of water is highly sensitive to climate change, um, with up to a third of U.S. counties at high to extremely high risk by 2050. It also illustrates, though, more importantly for this talk, uh, large differences among regions in this continent. So you can see the southwest, the southern Great Plains, and parts of Florida are at extremely high risk. Uh, for water sustainability challenges. Both climate and land use uh, and cover show regional variation in how they're actually changing. And these combine to influence the hydrologic cycle, such as through reductions in um, stream flow, uh, reductions in evapotranspiration uh, or infiltration during urbanization, or changes in the timing of spring runoff due to climate change. Um, so the map on the left here is just one example of a kind of land cover change. This is for 1950 to 2000, uh, showing the uh, increase in um, or change in uh, exurbanization. That's the development of housing outside of cities but still connected to them. And this is one example for climate change. Uh, this is actually a, uh, under the A2 scenario, an ensemble of, uh, of models uh, predicting spring precipitation showing uh, decreases in this region, mostly in the southern half, and then increases in the northern half. Um, these changes in the land and climate combine to produce impacts on stream flow and on aquatic ecosystems. And so it follows that societal responses to these changes are appropriate, that might be appropriate in one region, uh, may be inappropriate in another region. And compounding this problem of regional variation is the interaction of environmental social drivers, environmental and social drivers impacts and services at both regional and local scales. 
The context set by the regional characteristics determines how slow and fast uh, wa uh, local variables produce services or impacts. So um, these regional changes uh, influence local processes, which then have impacts and then feedback through human actors to, uh, to this system. So regional variation in drivers and resilience will influence how local catchments and infrastructures can and should be developed. So um, with this in mind, I want to turn now to a local example considering specifically the management of urban stormwater in an arid urban ecosystem. So Phoenix is a desert city in the U.S. Southwest. It was established during the late um, uh, 19th century, the late 1800s, by a largely agrarian society that harnessed two large rivers to irrigate crops. And so what you see here are the rivers coming together. Phoenix is this little uh, yellow blob here, and this is all irrigated farmland. This uh, map was drawn from 1912 data, and uh, what I'm going to actually show you in the next two slides are 60 years after that, 1975, and 100 years after that in 2006. Um, the setting here is a vast, flat alluvial plain in a hot, dry climate. And this has supported over tenfold increase in population and a large expansion of the urban environment uh, in the past 50 years or so. So that's 1912. Um, you can see that by 1975, the cities had grown together, consuming farmland. And here in this photo, you see this housing development marching across farmland. And by today, the population has increased to over 4 million people, and the city has expanded more recently at the expense of desert. So here you see this uh, housing development marching into the desert. Well, obviously, during this urbanization, many land surface changes affect hydrologic processes and the routing of water. Uh, Large-scale diversions and groundwater withdrawals occur to supply water to the population. Streams are buried, channelized, or paved over. Um, connectivity is disrupted or altered in some way, although not always, uh, uh, not always um, reduced, um, and that depends on infrastructure, as you'll see in the next part of the talk. There are increases in impervious cover, but an important distinction is that in the desert, um, many of the new land covers that are put in place may actually be more pervious than the surrounding desert that they replaced. And you can see that in these photographs at the top, all of this green area, golf courses, and so forth, that might increase the perviousness of this region. So the questions we're addressing in this research are, first, um, how do these changes affect two ecosystem services? The transport and retention of water, which is a stormwater protection service, and of sediment and nutrients, which is uh, water quality improvement. And I'm sorry that I only have time to talk today about the uh, stormwater protection part of this. And the second question is, does infrastructure matter? So to tell you what I mean by infrastructure, um, I'm going to contrast three watersheds here with different types of infrastructure. So what you see on the left uh, is a pipe uh, infrastructure. This is where all the water is directed underground into a series of pipes. This middle one is a series of washes. Washes are uh, ephemeral channels that are sort of semi-natural, um, not lined usually. Um, and then retention basins, which are depressions in the landscape that collect water directed into it from storms. And the red lines in this, in this uh, watershed here are the pipes. In this one, you can see these green lines, which are the washes. And in this one, you can see quite a few of these blue blobs, which are the retention basins that the washes are flowing into. And so as we go from the pipe to the retention basin and wash, we're decreasing the connectedness of the upland to the, to the uh, lower portion of the watershed um, during storms. We have, in fact, uh, uh, 12 nested catchments instrumented, and our approach is to sample every storm that has occurred over a two-year period. We're not quite finished. We're hoping for some storms this summer. Um, and uh, it's, it's really challenging to monitor flow in these semi-arid ephemeral systems because of the infrequent nature uh, of these storms and the short duration of runoff events. 
Um, therefore, the monitoring is very opportunistic, and our approach is centered around monitoring these um, short duration events using ISCO auto samplers. Uh, here's our um, designer ISCO uh, camouflage to blend into the urban environment. Um, here's one of the events occurring in, in one of the larger um, uh, systems. Uh, this is a, a land classification that's, that's underway right now, and, and, and uh, this is part of our team. And I particularly want to point out Rebecca Hale, a graduate student, and Laura Turnbull, a postdoc, who were instrumental in this work. Um, what you see here is a sort of um, watershed that I showed you earlier with the retention basins. There's several of these nested within uh, each other and nested ultimately within this larger watershed, Indian Ben Wash, that I'll talk about a little bit later. That drains a large portion of Scottsdale, which is part of the Phoenix metropolitan area, which is located here in the arid southwestern portion of, the, of North America. So if we look at total seasonal runoff and rainfall during the 2011 uh, winter rainy season, here we can see that um, along uh, this we have the, uh, the different uh, infrastructure types. And here we have um, rainfall and runoff in millimeters. Um, and, and despite the fact that uh, rainfall was relatively similar across um, this season for um, these different uh, basins, um, they produced six to eight runoff events um, that uh, showed very strong differences in um, the amount of runoff produced by that rainfall. So catchments with uh, washes and retention basins have greatly reduced uh, seasonal runoff. So retention basins do, in fact, retain water. And washes also transmit a lower proportion of the rainfall, um, presumably due to transmission losses. A second sort of interesting finding, if you look um, at individual storms um, that produce runoff, we find that in contrast to more mesic regions, urban streams appear to be no more flashy than their desert counterparts. So you can see two hydrographs here. This one is for several of our um, instrumented uh, washes here, and this one is for Sycamore Creek, which is a surrounding non-urbanized stream um, in uh, experiencing a flash flood. And you can see these hydrographs are very similar. And this may be uh, because the desert hydrograph is really much more like a parking lot hydrograph uh, than, uh, is, than is a, um, uh, a mesic hydrograph from a forested watershed, for example. And then if we look at the individual um, uh, events and compare runoff as a function of storm size for all events, along this urban hydrologic connectivity gradient, uh, we find that responses to rainfall vary dramatically with infrastructure type. If you have piped watersheds, you get about 65 to 68% of the water out. Most of the rest of that has probably evaporated. With washes, you get a lower slope and a much lower slope with the retention basins. And that water is moving through soil columns or through the washes down into uh, the Vados zone and groundwater, potentially providing a groundwater um, uh, recharge service, but also um, research that we've done has shown that there is a water quality improvement service that is done particularly for um, removal of nitrogen in these systems. So during the course of urbanization, these major changes to hydrologic systems occur. But they don't have to conform to the old models of pipe drainage or concrete flumes. So I want to show you here an example from Scottsdale, Arizona, from this largest system, Indian Pen Wash. Um, and this is a photo that was taken in, an air photo taken in 1935. And you can see that the wash flows through farmland at that time. Um, and in the past 75 years, this area has developed uh, completely as it is now in the center of the Phoenix uh, metropolitan area. But note please that the wash here is wide and unconstrained and it's wide because of big floods that occur there. So this is a photo from 2000 and it's the same place and you can see that a great deal of development has continuous, completely built up uh, mostly with housing developments. But in the intervening years between 1935 and 2000, flooding threatened homes and businesses that had encroached upon the wash, that had been built too close to the wash. 
And so this alternative green belt was designed um, in the 1970s um, in order to um, allow floods to pass without damage to property. Uh, uh, and so what it essentially consists of is a wide floodplain with recreational spaces, a series of lakes connected by streams. Um, and when it flows, I just want to show you a picture of where it flows. Uh, you this all connects up and uh, the floodplain gets inundated. Here you can see one of the lakes overspilling. Here you can see water going across a road. And stormwater losses are minor because the land here is set aside for this ecosystem service of absorbing stormwater. So to return to the concept of ecosystem services, um, uh, we can imagine a stick diagram. If you think of all of the ecosystem services that aquatic systems could provide, um, we can think of a stick diagram that when completely filled becomes a flower. Isn't that nice? Um, when all or at least some subset of these ecosystem services are bundled in designing urban aquatic ecosystems, we could create a flower from the stick diagram. So looking at some of the stormwater drainage systems and designs in Phoenix Metro, um, these are some photographs of those. And of course, none of these are intended to deliver water, so they, they don't have anything on this water transport stick. Um, but a lot of them, or water delivery, sorry, but a lot of them um, are, are, are better than others at, um, at certain things, certain services like water quality improvement or um, uh, recreation, for example. This one might have a little recreation if you were a skateboarder. Um, but basically, um, I think you can see that um, it is possible um, to improve the delivery of the ecosystem services associated with aquatic environments by using uh, management, restoration, and design. So to summarize at the local scale, there is some possibility for urban catchments to be resilient by design. Uh, the, I think the key to this resilience is latitude, the idea that we create flexible systems that can handle the new normal of um, stormwater that will be occurring uh, as climate changes. And after all, I think it is within cities themselves um, that we hold the creative possibilities to design with ecosystem services in mind and afford local adaptation to climate change. Um, I'm probably over my time, but I wanted to say uh, three more things. I have three more slides, and I want to put on my NSF hat here. Um, and what I've been talking about is one aspect of the rapid, multifaceted global change that um, is challenging human well-being in our future. Uh, today's Global Climate Change Symposium highlighted some of the most politically uh, contentious, but ultimately perhaps one of the greatest challenges of our future. Uh, meeting the grand challenge of sustainability requires multifaceted approaches, and the National Science Foundation in the US has new funding programs to address sustainability. Um, this challenge, this sustainability challenge, has been articulated by many entities, including the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the Belmont Forum, and recently um, the Earth Future Initiative. Sorry. Um, here is the statement uh, that we have on our website for the um, science, engineering, and education for sustainability uh, at the National Science Foundation. Um, SEAS is a portfolio uh, a collection of programs focused on humans, natural, and built systems and characterized by systems thinking and established net establishing networks and partnerships. So I thought it would be important to raise this issue here because CES is actively seeking international partnerships to build upon these programs and uh, I thought it would be appropriate to mention here at this uh, meeting in Asia, first meeting in 77 years in Asia. So I'd like to acknowledge many collaborations in these groups listed here, uh, my lab and Dan Childers' lab at ASU, um, the uh, working group at NCs, another working group associated with the National Climate Assessment, um, and the National Science Foundation for funding my research and for hiring me for the past two years. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Kazuko Shinohara for the translations that she did. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. Arigato gozaimashita.
Thank you, Nancy. That, that was wonderful. Uh, we now have a, a few minutes available for questions. If any, we have two microphones down here at the front, if you'd like to come on down. I know it's quite a hike there from the back. And I'd like to start, actually. I have a number of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you talked about, um, in, the, in the first part of, of your talk, you talked about the concept of tipping points and mm -hmm. thresholds. Right. And I wonder what that meant in, a, in an urban environment. Does, are you thinking in terms of the, the point at which urban environments no longer become inhabitable? Or are you thinking of lesser sorts of, of changes within the environment? Well, that's a good question. And of course, you can say it depends on the scale. That's always a good answer to any question that's hard to answer. Um, but I actually think that um, we are talking about uh, cities becoming uninhabitable. That's the kind of tipping point threshold that I'm talking about. Um, and that's really a hard thing to envision because um, cities seem to be so permanent. You know, they seem to have all this hard infrastructure that makes it really hard to, to change them. But um, uh, when you look at, at um, certainly the disasters that have happened uh, here in Japan, as well as um, you know, some of the other disasters worldwide, I think that that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. Yeah. I can see no one's prepared to make the long hike there. <laughs> here, comes, here comes our hike. Here we have a question. <laughs> yes, please, over to you. Hi, thanks for the uh, talk. And in this uh, urban environment that's developing, has developed, it's got these great tentacles going out into the rest of the area that is un relatively uninhabited. I mean, it's functioning, but it's a great sucking sound uh, going from one to the other. And in that, uh, there's a, a, a lack of appreciation for what's happening in the rural side of it. And yet the voters and the power structure is in the urban side. So there's a disconnect between the decision-making matrix in the urban centers from the much larger area, which is being sucked of its resources in one point of view. <laughs> and so there's more people in Houston, in Chicago, many more than there are in the whole state of Iowa, which is feeding Chicago, for example. So I'm wondering uh, what um, venues you might suggest to um, bridge this, this gap, which is there already, and what it's going to only be worse in the future because people really are about two or three trophic levels away from reality in the cities, yet they're dependent upon the systems they, very, they don't understand very well. And to leave, live that to technocrats leaves it into a homogenized landscape, which is not healthy either for the people that are living there. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Um, it's one of the points I tried to make and, and often try to make about cities is that we cannot think of them as these isolated entities that are not connected to the rest of the world. A very large proportion of the greenhouse gas production, for instance, um, that we're seeing uh, increases in um, uh, annually are, are coming from cities. And um, cities are also taking in material from, from the surroundings. So we have this concept of the urban footprint um, that has been a, a, a very useful, I think, heuristic. Um, but I think just, just as the governor said today that um, people need to be more connected with the water and the lake, I think that people in cities need to be more connected with the hinterlands that, that, they, that they depend upon. But I would put this question to you, and I'm not answering your political question, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I would put this question back at you, which is, if we're going to have 10 billion people on this planet, what's the best way that, to configure? How should we live? Should we be spread out evenly across the landscape, or should we be concentrated in cities? And if we're concentrated in cities, where much innovation is developed and so forth, can't we think about the optimistic view of this is we can think about creating solutions and the kinds of uh, environments that are not such a huge drain on the hinterlands, not such a huge drain on uh, the remaining population in the rural landscapes and so forth. Um, so, so I think you know, cities, cities and urbanization are here to stay. 
The real question is, how do we make them sustainable? Is it possible to make them sustainable? Because I think that's the way that we're going to be living. So if we don't solve the sustainability challenge for cities, we're not going to solve the sustainability challenge, period. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. And I would like to have some hint from you. You are talking about the three types of, you know, risk aversion systems. Pipes, and second is... Washes. Wash, and third is... Retention basins. Retention. Mm -hmm. And do you think about the dam systems? Because now in this... Lake Beer Watershed, and as a governor, we have very big debate about this flood control. And as a researcher, and also you know, advocating the people's interaction between the lakes and rivers, I advocate those, you know, the more retention systems. Mm -hmm. But some you know, people are still insisting on the huge dam systems, dam and pipe systems, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and actually in Lake Bia areas and all over Japan now we have debate. So if you have any, you know, advice about those, you know, debate. Uh, I understand the situation is quite different. Japan is huge. How, how do you call the steep rivers mm -hmm. and more mountainous mm -hmm. compared with your, say, Phoenix or the American. So you may not think about the dam, huge dam systems, yeah. but pipes and dam could be the kind of um, similar systems. Yeah, and, so these are flood oh, control oh, dams you. that you're thinking about? Because uh, flood... Flood control dams would be a little bit different than water supply. We have quite a few dams in the Phoenix area. Uh, I think the challenge is that each, um, the solutions that are appropriate for one region aren't necessarily going to be appropriate for another region. Um, but it, I think if you keep this ecosystem service concept in mind, you think about what are the things that I'm trying to get out of a stormwater system? Because we, we, we would tend to think in the old days of just the idea is to get the water out of here, right? Um, not recognizing that where it was going was actually, it, there was a big impact of, of the water that was being run off from, from urban environments. And so we want to think about is retention an appropriate thing? But in a really wet environment, it might be very difficult to retain uh, water. You might just fill up these basins or ponds and, and have no place for the water to go. So, so it's going to be uh, situation appropriate. But I think you need to think about what are the suite of ecosystem services that you want to get out of that system. You want to hold back water or you want to um, uh, improve the water quality or you want to slow down the uh, damaging high flows that that could potentially destroy property and erode sediments and so forth. So all of those things should have some uh, appropriate design associated with them. And I think the problem is that too often we've decided this is the way that we build these things because it's always been done that way or because that's what the book says. And, and I'm just advocating that we think more on an ecological sense of, of what the services we might get out of those systems could be. Well, thank you very much. It's time for us to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you for that inspiring beginning.